morning, everyone. Um, the first reading today is Romans 8, 28 to 39. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for his good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Jesus Christ is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Thanks for doing that, Katie. And now to the text with which we shall shortly engage. Second Samuel chapter 10. After this, the king of the Ammonites died, and Hunan, his son, reigned in his place. And David said, I will deal loyally with Hanun, the son of Nahash, as his father dealt loyally with me. So David sent his servants to console him concerning his father. And David's servants came into the land of the Ammonites. But the princes of the Ammonites said to Hanun, their lord, Do you think that David has sent comforters to you, that he's honoring your father? Has not David sent his servants to you to search the city and to spy it out and to overthrow it? So Hanun took David's servants, and shaved off half the beard of each, and cut off their garments in the middle at their hips, and sent them away. When it was told David, he sent to meet them, for the men were greatly ashamed. And the king said, Remain at Jericho until your beards have grown, and then return. When the Ammonites saw that they had become a stench to David, the Ammonites sent and hired the Syrians of Beth Rahab and the Syrians of Zobah, 20,000 foot soldiers, and the king of Maaka with a thousand men, and the men of Tob, 12,000 men. And when David heard of it, he sent Joab and all the host of his mighty men. And the Ammonites came out and drew up in battle array at the entrance of the gate. And the Syrians of Robah and of Rehob and the men of Tob and Maaka were by themselves in the open country. And when Joab saw that the battle was set against him both in the front and in the rear, he chose some of his best men of Israel and arrayed them against the Syrians. The rest of his men he put in charge of Abishai, his brother, and he arrayed them against the Ammonites. And he said, If the Syrians are too strong for me, then you shall help me. But if the Ammonites are too strong for you, then I will come and help you. Be of good courage, and let us be courageous for our people and for the cities of our God, and may the Lord do what seems good to him. So Joab and the people who were with him drew near to battle against the Syrians, and they fled before him. 
And when the Ammonites saw that the Syrians fled, they likewise fled before Abishai and entered the city. Then Joab returned from fighting against the Ammonites and came to Jerusalem. But when the Syrians saw that they had been defeated by Israel, they gathered themselves together and Hazardazir sent and brought out the Syrians who were beyond the Euphrates. And they came to Helam with Shobach, the commander of the army of Hadazazir, at their head. And when it was told David, he gathered all Israel together and crossed the Jordan and came to Helam. The Syrians arrayed themselves against David and fought with him. And the Syrians fled before Israel. And David killed of the Syrians the men of 700 chariots and 40,000 horsemen and wounded Shobak, the commander of their army, so that he died there. And when all the kings who were the servants of Hadazazir saw that they had been defeated by Israel, they made peace with Israel and became subject to them. So the Assyrians were afraid to save the Ammonites anymore. Father in heaven, since it has pleased you to give us your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, we are confident this morning that you will assist us in understanding this text and in granting us the grace to apply it and to grow in the Christian faith and to, uh, to serve you in such a way that it brings honor to your name. For in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Well, let's have some context for our text, shall we? Just by way of illustration. By 1942, all of Europe, all of Western Europe, had fallen under the Nazi boot. And it was a cruel and black darkness. But in June 1944, the Allied armies launched a counterattack and they landed on the beaches of Normandy, France. And if they can hold that foothold against all the ferocious opposition that is fired, that is thrown against them, if they can hold on to that foothold, they can expand out and regain Europe. And the context of our story is something like that. God's most precious creation, mankind made in the image of God, has been taken by the devil, fallen to Satan and to his minions. And it is Satan and his kingdom that lies. It is Satan and his kingdom that holds the hearts of men in bondage and fear and service, and rules over the nation all the way from the Mediterranean to the Sea of Japan. But, but God has established a foothold or a beachhead, like, well, like Normandy in France, like that. And that foothold is his people with his law in his land, being ruled by his king. And here it is. We've just read about it in our text. It's King David. And in a world of profound spiritual darkness and antipathy, hatred to God, this David, this kingdom, this knowledge of God is like a light shining in the darkness. And the message is, there is, yes, there is a faithful, gracious God, the maker of heavens and earth, not like the gods of wood and stone that require blood and exercise terror. No. There is a God, gracious and kind, merciful, the maker of heavens and earth, who wishes to be reconciled to his rebellious creation. And it is his, his, his intention to spread his kingdom through his people to every nation on the earth and restore his glory and regain everything that was lost. Hmm. David knows this. 
he understands the big plan of God, the big picture, and he's, he's evangelical like us. Remember he wrote in the Psalms, I will teach sinners your ways and sinners will return to you. So in our text, it flows naturally that David, when the king of the Ammonites dies, says, I will deal loyally with Hanun, the son of Nahash, as his father dealt loyally with me. And we can please scratch out of your ears for you the word loyally. It doesn't really do it justice. It's the word is kindness. It's exactly the same word that, day that is used when David shows kindness to Mephibosheth, who's like a, a lost lamb on a cold mountain night, when he shows kindness to Mephibosheth and brings him to Jerusalem. It's kindness. David is showing kindness to Hanun, the son of Nahish. Now, it seems that David and Nahish, the previous king of the Ammonites, had some kind of relationship, trust and loyalty. It didn't, doesn't mean that they played bridge together late at night. It means that there was a relationship of trust and loyalty. It's like in the New Testament text, we should do good to all men that we might by all means save some. And who knows what may come from David's kindness. That's his motivation, I believe. Uh, several of his mighty men have come in from the surrounding nations. Naaman, the Syrian general, has, comes in later from the surrounding nations. And so David, evangelical David, sends out his servants or ambassadors to console Hanun. And they come into the land of the Ammonites. Like Australian Presbyterian missionaries, I expect. Like that. But, indeed, but, the princes of the Ammonites suffer from the problem or the practice of projection. Projection is when you lie constantly. You think others lie Or to cover your own deceit, you keep yourself, and to keep yourself morally superior, superior, you accuse others of deceit. We see it all the time. And David's servants, alas, endure a profound humiliation. Half of their beards are cut off. Imagine that, Mr. Duncanson. <laughs> Do you think would we see Ben in church next week? Okay, half of their beards cut off, their garments are so cut that they're naked from the waist down, and then they're sent packing. It's acutely shameful, acutely shameful to those men, an insult to David, and quite also, I think, deliberately an insult to David's God, and also an act of war. That's what it is. The Ammonites know that, and that's why they mobilize first. And knowing full well that David has a reputation in battle, they hire in the Syrians of Beth Rahab, and more Syrians, 20,000, and the king of Maaka, 1,000. And ju just to make sure, the men of Tob, 12,000 men. So that, that kindness of David has been a trigger for the nations to rise up and war against Israel. I would think, quite frankly, demonic influence. To remove from the face of the earth this foothold. To sweep it off to the dustbin of history. So that God's people exist no more. David hears of it. And he sends Jibe and all the host of mighty men and Ammonites array themselves for battle at the gate of their city. Yes, it's the Ammonites. The Ammonites who have the, the practice of ripping out the right eye of their captives. And the Syrians are in the open country. And our text says that Joab saw the battle was set against him both in the front and in the rear. Set against him both in the front and in the rear. That means he is severely militarily disadvantaged. So, this is a perilous moment for Israel. They're in a foreign, hostile land. They face a formidable, experienced opponent, opponents. It's going to be hand-to-hand -hand combat. 
And from the get-go, the battle is set against them. So, we can work out. We are at the climax of the tension of the story. And we can follow that rising tension in the story ourselves. We don't need a PhD in English literature. We can work it out. There's David's kindness. It begins with that, right? David's kindness. Then the insult. Then the Ammonites mobilize. And then they bring in all the surrounding nations. What's going to happen now? And then, and then there's Joab, and he's right there. It's the day of fire and sword, and he can see. Wow, this is not a good circumstance we're in. The Ammonites on this side, the Syrians on the other. So that's the high point of the tension in the story. What's going to happen now? I'm pointing this out to you because if we can locate the high point of tension in the story, we can work out the main message of the story and the significance of the text. Well, what happens now at this critical point is that Job sees with his two battle-hardened eyes that the battle is set against him. Enemy there. Enemy there. He's in a win-or-die circumstance. And what happens now is that Job takes a calculated risk. He doesn't know the outcome of the day. It's not inevitable that Job and his armies will win. So he puts his best men against the Syrians, and the rest are led by Abishai against the Ammonites. And Job cries out and says to his armies, Be of good courage. Let us be courageous for our people. And for the cities of our God, and may the Lord do what seems good to him. And, in case you're wondering, I have no problem with those words coming out of the mouth of Job. Yes, he is a vindictive, brutal, self-serving man. Also a brilliant leader of men in war. And if God can speak through Balaam, uh, the false prophet in the book of Numbers, he can certainly speak through Joab. And that is what we're reading. And it is here, it is here that the text turns at this point. And the tension that I've already mentioned to you begins to fall away. This is the high point of our text. Are we all on the same page? We all agreed. Can you see that in your scriptures? How that built up to this high point. It's not actually about the numerical significance of 12,000 men or 20,000 men and how that ties in with the book of Revelation. It's about this turning point where Job instructs his men to have confidence in the, good of, in the goodness of God and, to, and he takes that risk and sends his men into battle. And the battle is begun. And Joab's risk pays off. The Syrians fled. And the Ammonites likewise fled into their city fortress. So Joab returned to Jerusalem. Then in verse 15, we have round two. This time it's the Syrians who bring mercenaries from beyond the Euphrates. David gathers all Israel, crosses the Jordan. Another intense battle. The Syrians flee. 700 chariots lost, 40,000 horsemen killed. And we note, Shobak, the commander, dies in battle. And the Syrians are afraid to save the Ammonites again. And so the Ammonites and the nations are brought into submission to David and Israel. And David's servants, and we won't forget them, are vindicated and their shame removed. But note, the turning point was when Job, Joab weighed up the scene before him and he made that decision that he would take a risk in the knowledge that they were God's people and that he, him, the creator of heavens and earth, had the power and the desire to do good to his people as he had done when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. 
that kind of power, that kind of goodness. That's what Joab was referring to. Again, his words, be of good courage. Let us be courageous for our people, for our cities of our God, and may the Lord do what seems good to him. And in that knowledge, and in that biblical truth, the armies of Israel gather up their courage, go forth, and on the day they triumph. You agree? That's how the text moves. That's what's happening. And that is also where the text bites us or engages us today. You see, according to my reckoning, we don't, we don't live in desperate times as Joab did. We live in safe times, or so we think anyway. Our perception is that we live in safe times. We're not Overly desperate. And of all the people that have ever lived on this degraded and fallen planet, we live in a time that offers us a possibility, at least, of security, well-being, peace, and prosperity. And it's all really quite enchanting, or it can all be very enchanting, really. We are warm, self-developed, safe and dry and we play it safe we don't send missionaries out to die by the dozen as in bygone decade do we we have our insurance policies i'm not criticizing insurance policies i'm just saying we have insurance policies and government welfare for better or worse and we are risk adverse we tend to be risk adverse to be reluctant to take on risks. And I get that. I'm getting more risk adverse the older I get, I do think. But it's not always a good thing to be all about risk adversity. And it's not always helpful for the work of the kingdom. And I propose to you this morning, for your edification, for your sanctification, that the text is teaching us that you can afford to take a risk. You can afford to risk loss for the kingdom of God. That is my propositional statement. I propose to you that you can afford to take a risk for the kingdom of God. You can afford to do what Joab did. He wasn't being reckless. You can afford to do what... Esther did when she entered unbidden into the throne room of the great emperor. And she said, if I die, I die. Her words were, if I perish, I perish. We can afford to do what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did when they were commanded to bow down before a great gold statue. And they said, our God whom we serve will deliver us from your hand. But even if we, he does not, we will not bow down and worship your statue took a risk, a life or death risk. What Paul did on countless occasions for the gospel, what tens of thousands of men and women, followers of Christ have done since and are doing even on this day, all believe in the ruling goodness of God. That's their foundation. All took a risk. And so it is with us. We can afford to take a risk for the kingdom of God because we believe that our world has been flooded with the kindness or the goodness of God in Jesus Christ. Katie J read us, read us the scripture in Romans, didn't she? She told us all about the goodness, the kindness of God in Jesus Christ, which has flooded into the, into the world. We're now... 2022, 2022 years since that event that took place in human history. And Katie J read to us, we know that for those who love God, all things work together 
for good? Yes, for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. All things in the providence of God work together for good. We call that the ruling goodness of God. He has the desire to do us good and he has the power to do us good. He is both wise and he is kind. That is the ruling goodness of God. And he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, will he not also graciously give us all things? Yes. Yes, he will. And nothing shall separate us from the love of God and Jesus Christ. Not fire, nor water, nor tribulation, nor distress, life, death, angels, nor rules, nor anything else. In all of time and in all of creation. Listen, what we're talking about here now is fundamental to a working definition of Christian faith. That we Christians believe that God is kindly disposed to us. And that, that is what our faith looks like, that we, uh, that we put our trust in God, believing that he is kindly toward us, that he is has good intentions towards us, and that he has the power and the desire to bring them to pass. And just before we go on, if you're not a Christian or you're not sure how the Christian... Okay, it's a spiritual thing. Spiritual things can be vague and quite tricky at times. You're not sure about how the, the Christian spirituality works. The message that God is speaking to you is that God wishes you well. And he wishes you well in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in him you may be forgiven and you may be reconciled to him. You are a sinner. You have fallen short of the commands of God, of the will of God for your life. But you may be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is our nexus or meeting place. We meet with God through Jesus Christ. And in Jesus Christ, we are welcome into the presence of God. No matter our lies or deceit or, well, fornications, we are still welcome in Christ. They are forgiven. In Christ, no matter your weariness or tiredness of heart, we are welcome to be reconciled with God our Father through Jesus Christ. And if you will come to Jesus Christ, if you will repent, as the scriptures say, that means turn away from your own self-righteousness and trust in him, in Jesus Christ you will experience an inexhaustible supply of God's goodness. And that's what we believe. We Christians believe that. And believing that, it's right and it's reasonable to run a risk in his service. And so, we Christians take courage. We need to take courage. Because we know what we're up against. We know that the Christian voice is increasingly not welcome in our culture. Speech marks. If you want to be a Christian, just keep it inside your head. Go inside and stay inside your silly little churches and shut up or else. Oh, that's good advice, isn't it? Perhaps we should take it. And it seems as, as if the nations have risen up against Christ and the battle is set against us both in the front and in the rear. It does seem like that at times. But if you will take courage and speak of the kindness of God in Christ to family, friends, neighbors, community. Yes, I know we run the risk of being shamed and suffering lost. But we believe that God will turn that to good and he will build his kingdom through his people. Yes, it's risky to stand up, to stand up, to be that tall poppy for Christ we run a risk but we believe 
that we have girding us the goodness of God and God will build his kingdom through his people. And believing in the ruling goodness of God, we don't fall under the spell of comfort, prosperity and entertainment. We pray and we serve one another. We give our tithes and we offerings. We turn up to church and use our gifts for his kingdom. Yes, it eats into our time and it eats into our money. But God is building his kingdom and that is the price we're willing to pay. And if we're single, we don't marry outside the faith. It's better to risk remaining single, unmarried, than compromising our faith. We'll run that risk. And if we're offered work in places in a circumstance that is hostile to our faith or precludes our service to Christ, we'll let it pass and pay the price doing so and I want to assure you that if you will do this if you will run a risk for the kingdom of God if you will pay a price for doing so there is a day coming the word of God promises this God says there is a day coming when he the Lord Jesus Christ shall appear in majesty with his angels upon the clouds of heaven and every eye shall see him and every knee bow before him. And on that day, on that day above all days, everything that you gave up for him, every act of service, every cup of water, every act of kindness, every risk you took, Everything you lost in his service will be put right and restored and rewarded. And if false charges have been brought against you, you will be vindicated. And all those that have despised you will look upon you and know that you have what they do not have, the most wonderful, precious good in all the universe. And that will be yours. And you will rejoice. You will rejoice that you took that risk, paid that price, because it was worth it. Yes, a thousand times over, it was worth it. And amen, amen. Father in heaven, we thank you that uh, we have such a savior who inspires us to encourage, to, to courage, who inspires us to service, who inspires us to give uh, our time, our tithes, our lives faithfully in service. We thank you for the promises that you have given us in scripture that we have every reason to be confident that despite uh, the things that we suffer despite the losses that we take dis despite the times that we are shamed for being Christians Lord all is well all is well between heaven and earth all is well in our souls and you have done us the greatest good and we are as safe now as we ever shall be. And we look forward to that time when we shall see you face to face. And we shall rejoice with great joy. In Jesus' name.